Of course, there's a big elephant in the room always, <laughs> which is called AI, yeah. right? And so I know that you are an expert in the subject, and we are going. We are living now in this very interesting times of new uh, AI systems coming online, pretty much every couple of weeks. So, I kind of, um, to me, uh, that whole debate about what is it, what is artificial intelligence, where is it going, what should we do about it, um, needs an influx of this type of considerations that we've just been talking about. That, for instance, the idea that inspiration, creativity, doesn't come from accumulation of knowledge. Because obviously a child, a child has not yet accumulated knowledge. And yet the great ones are on record saying that a child has a capacity to, to create. And an adult credits the inner child. The inner child, yeah. Uh, for this capacity to create a, a, as an adult, you see. That's kind of weird if we take the point of view that everything is computation, everything is accumulation of knowledge, that just bigger and bigger data sets, finer and finer on neural networks, and then we will be able to replicate human consciousness. If we take that point of view, then what I just said kind of doesn't fit. Because obviously a child has not been fed any training data, <laughs> as far as we know. Yet they're perfectly capable of, of, you know, of distinguishing between cats and dogs, for instance, and stuff like that. But much more than that, they're also capable of that, you know, wide-eyed, you know, sort of perspective. So does it, can it really be captured, that perspective, that sense of awe, can it really be captured by computation alone? I actually, I don't know the answer, so I'm not sort of trying to uh, to present a particular point of view. I'm just trying to question um, any theory that starts out by saying life is this or consciousness is this. Because when you look more closely, you recognize that there are some other things at play which do not quite fit the narrative. And it's hard to know where they come from. It's it's also possible that the evolutionary process has created is the very it is computation, and the and the child is actually not a blank slate, but the result of one of the most incredible several billion year old computations uh, that that had explored all kinds of aspect of of life on earth of uh, of war and love and terror and ambition and violence and invention all of that from the bacteria to today mm -hmm. so like that young child is not is not a blank slate they're sure. they're coming they're they're actually they, hold within yeah, we, them the knowledge of several billions of years right the question is whether as a child you carry that in the form of the kind of computational algorithms that we are aware of today. You see, what what strikes me as unlikely is that, how should I put it? How interesting that, you know, we you you are a computer scientist, and there are other people. Come, I have studied computer science, so I know a little bit. And so it's tempting to say, oh, the whole world is computer science, or mm -hmm. is based can be explained by computer science. Yes. Why? because it makes me feel good, because I have mastered it, I have learned it. Yeah. My ego is very happy. Yeah. And people come to me and, and, and they look up to me and they revere me. Kind of like priests in the old, in the old days when the religion was paramount, when, the, when you would, be, would tend to explain things in theological, religious terms. Today, science has progressed. There are fewer people who kind of buy into relig official religion, you know? So we have this urge, I suppose, to, to explain and to know, and to dissect, and to analyze, and to conceptualize, which is a wonderful quality that we have, and we should definitely uh, pursue that. But I find it a little bit unlikely that the universe is just exactly what I have learned, <laughs> and not something that I don't know, you see? Well, there's a lot of interesting aspects of the current large language models that one perspective of it I think speaks to the love and math mm -hmm. that you talk to, which is they're trained on the human data from the internet. 
So at its best, a large language model like GPT-4 captures the magic of the human condition on its full display, its full complexity. And so it's mimicking, it's trying to compress all the weirdness of humans, of all the debates and discussions, the perspectives, all the different ways that people approach solving different problems, all of that mm -hmm. compressed. So we live, we're each individual ants. We only have like, we have a family, we interact with a few little ants. And here comes AI that's able to summarize like a TLDR, report yeah. of humanity. And, and that's the beauty of it. So yeah. I embrace it. But I wonder if- I'm very that, impressed by it. I wonder if it can be very impressive, meaning way more impressive in being able to uh, fake or simulate or emulate a human. Than, fake, I'm glad you you mentioned that because that's just, that seems to be the mantra. It's just fake, word, fake it till you make it, yeah. isn't it? Isn't that what we all do though? <laughs> no, well, yes, we do that, but we, we also do other things. We can yeah. be truly in love. We can be truly inspired when it is not fake. I do believe, call me romantic, okay? But I do believe, and this is a very good, I'm glad we are, you're putting it in these terms because I've had conversations like that. That, yeah, fake it till you make it, but that's like, that's what humans do. Yes, we do that, but not all the time. So, and that is debatable because also, I speak from my own experience. And that's where the first person perspective comes in, mm -hmm. the subjective view. I cannot prove to you, for instance, or anyone else that there are certain moments in my life where I, I am genuine, I am pure, so to speak, when it's not faking it. Mm -hmm. But I do, I do have a tremendous certainty of it. And that's a subjective certainty. Now, I am, as a scientist, I'm also trained to give more um, credibility to objective arguments that, you know, the things that can be reproduced, things that I, I can demonstrate, that I can show. But as I get older, <laughs> shall we there say, we go. <laughs> as I get more mature, shall we, hopefully, you know, I'm starting to question why I am not giving as much credibility to my subjective understanding of the world, the kind of the first person perspective, when actually modern science has already sold on that. You know, quantum mechanics has shown unambiguously that the observer is always involved in the observation. Mm -hmm. Likewise, Gödel's incompleteness theorems to me uh, show that how essential uh, 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 is the observer of a, of a mathematical theory. <laughs> yeah. For one thing, that's the one who chooses the axioms. Yes. And we can talk about this in more detail. Likewise, Einstein's relativity where Time is relative to the observer, for instance. That's brilliant. You're just describing in all of these different scales, the observer, what the observer. That's right.